So hello and welcome to our weekly episodes with myself and Carlina and we have an amazing guest with us today as well. As always, giving you tips, advice and content about what's happening around in the world on, on how to add value into the marketplace. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, nice to be here again on Friday. Um, before we jump onto today's topic, which is like super exciting and, and one of my most favorite ones ever, I want to recap what happened last week. Um, we spoke of the people who are uh, thinking of, you know, quitting their jobs or the ones who are already uh, fired and looking for a new job. So we talked to the people who want to find a job. But this week, we figured, you know, there might be some of you out there who have been sitting there thinking, I have a dream. I've always had this dream to do something on my own. So today we, we, we said, yes, let's talk about how do you begin that dream? What are the right things that you should be doing? What are the things that you shouldn't be doing if you want to be successful? So indeed, we have an amazing guest today, Lena. Yeah, so we have John Gale um, with us today. It's an absolute uh, privilege and, 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 and honor to have John with us. He has. 25 years experience in advising high-tech startups in the Silicon Valley and all over the world really seven other main countries but John has advised startups mainly high-tech startups um, in the Silicon Valley based in London um, has three white papers published all around this topic so an absolute expert to be with us today so yes welcome John well thank you happy to be here Yeah, John, um, before like we start picking your brain literally, is there something <laughs> that you would actually want to tell the world about yourself? Okay, well, I guess the, the short version that relates to what we're talking about today is uh, that I worked in manufacturing engineering and then in custom computer sales, and then I became a vice president in a merger and acquisition unit uh, part of what's now Thomson Reuters. And then I became a consultant, uh, first for the Fortune 500 and then for uh, shortly after that for uh, high-tech startups. After I'd done that for a while, I moved to Silicon Valley. And while I was there, I was a member of the board of directors of the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council, which is the umbrella group over the professional engineering societies in Silicon Valley. There's 40,000 engineers uh, in Silicon Valley. And I uh, co-founded a couple startups, uh, was business uh, VP of business development, a couple other startups, and then eventually moved to Europe. So that's the short version. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, as we spoke earlier, we know that your particular experience is, experience is dealing more with people who currently are actually at work. They might be executives working for uh, an enterprise and they are the ones thinking, well, I do want to have something on my own. Uh, would you please describe some of the issues that you have found with this, um, with the situation for them? Okay, so this is taking somebody who's an executive with an established company who's thinking about leaving and starting a startup. And he, he really has three choices. He can either stay and do the job he's doing, or he can try to convince that established company to start an entrepreneurial activity internally to the company, or he can leave and start a startup. If he tries to do the entrepreneurial activity within the established company, he will find that there are probably a significant number of executives who think that they have the ability to be involved in the various decisions around what the focus of that entrepreneurial activity will be and how it's funded and uh, assessing whether or not it's working properly. If he leaves and starts a startup, then the difference is that he has absolutely no structure other than what he creates. Uh, so for example, uh, there's nobody to tell him what to do. There's nobody to be accountable to. There's new types of risks. For example, there's no paycheck. There's no insurance. Nobody cares about whether he's successful or a failure. It's much harder to get business people to take your phone calls. And so in short, there's no organization at all other than what you create. So that's very difficult. But the positive 
side of that is that he only has to keep his investors and his board of directors pleased with progress, which is a smaller number of stakeholders than what he would have if he stayed inside that established organization. So in many ways, I think it's easier for the guy to leave and start a standalone startup. But if he does that, he, it would really be ideal if he has experience as a significant level of management, profit and loss responsibility would be great, uh, doing something in sales or marketing or business development, and being involved in the launching of new products in the same target market, which he now wants to address with his startup. Now, of course, he probably has an employment agreement uh, with that company he's leaving. So he needs to be sure that he's not violating that employment agreement uh, with what he does, because if he is, then investors won't invest in what his activity is. Yeah. So it's a really so, interesting, so the, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Lena. No, it's fine. I was just saying, it's a really interesting point about um, doing some, having an entrepreneurial idea within your current company. Um, I know you said you wouldn't necessarily advise that, but what would that look like for a potential, um, you know, viewer if they are in the, the they, they might be facing redundancy or they're on furlough and they're not sure what's happening with their job. How can they use what we call an employeepreneur mindset and how do they approach the the people within the existing company if he wants to undertake an entrepreneurial journey within the existing business what would that look like well ideally the person he would need to approach would be his boss so that there wouldn't be issues about what his boss thought about what he was doing and how he described that to the other person uh, but he could basically say well uh, there's reasons to believe that, that there will be external entrepreneurial activity that will launch new products that will compete with us. And so it would be to our advantage to mm. launch that uh, activity internally so that we can defend ourselves against that. And so then he has to go through the idea of uh, creating the established organization to create a new activity, which doesn't fit into the prior budgets and uh, organization structure and then getting support for that. And some companies are much better prepared to do that than others. Yeah. Uh, once he's achieved that basic structure, then the advantage he has is he's got a paycheck, unlike if he goes out and starts a startup or he doesn't have any paycheck, yeah. but he, he has a paycheck, he's got uh, all the benefits of being an employee, you know, insurance and all those other things. Um, there's a lot of people around to talk to, there'll be people who will be happy to, uh, you know, give him moral support, um, you know, which he's not going to have on the outside. And uh, so in some ways it's very easier. But one of the interesting things that I've seen when I've attested, attended a couple of uh, workshops in London where there were about 20 VPs of product development from you know, major established companies there. And then there were about five of us consultants and we were spending the day talking about how to develop new products in this entrepreneurial sort of activity that you're talking about. And in each of those two cases, after three or four hours, I stood up and I said, well, uh, you people are all acting in a very professional way. You're doing things, you know, the way I was taught to do them when I uh, was getting my MBA. And that's all wonderful, but it's taking you, you know, six, nine, 12 months to make a major decision. Mm -hmm. And the startup guy is going to know that he needs to make decisions very quickly. Mm -hmm. So in the course of, let's say that nine months, uh, we're going to expect him to make, you know, six or eight, maybe even more decisions. And so uh, the risk that the major company has, if they're competing with the startup guy, is that if the startup guy has a good business plan, attracts the right people and attracts the right funding, he's going to be able to move a lot faster than the guy in the larger company will move. 
You know, John, we spoke earlier, um, there, there's this uh, very, not, not such a nice fact, you know, that 95% uh, of the companies, uh, let's say in Latvia, that get open, they close down within the first five years. And so you just mentioned some people that you've worked with, they have those skills that they got from, uh, let's say, an MBA. But maybe there's something else that you would still like to add. What are the, the useful things, the skills that uh, a startup CEO should possess? Okay, well, first I would say, if you took a thousand companies that were funded, or excuse me, founded in Silicon Valley, uh, maybe one of those will be a major success story, like a, uh, a Facebook or, you know, something else that's a really significant success. Um, and then uh, maybe you'll have another 10, 20, 50 who are moderate successes. And then you're going to have a huge number of uh, failures. And uh, those are going to happen some in the first six months, some in the first year, some in the second or third year. But uh, what I'm going to say is there's a, there's a higher failure, failure rate there than, than what you've experienced in, in Latvia, uh, because it's a very competitive world. Um, so uh, your question was then, what sorts of characteristics does the team need, or what was your question? It was about, so those that made it through and became really successful, what skills did you find different in those CEOs? Okay, you know? uh, so people have done a lot of studying of startups in Silicon Valley. Uh, when you live there, one of the problems you have is you're always receiving letters from professors who want you to answer their surveys so that they can you know, write whatever report they wanna write. Uh, but, uh, one of the research uh, projects said, okay, if we look at only those startups that become unicorns, uh, the CEOs of the successful unicorn, at the time they founded the startup, were between 40 and 45 and had uh, experience with a significant management job in a well-managed company. In other words, they really understood all their management issues before they went in they, in almost all cases, would have had previous experience uh, launching a product to the particular uh, target market that they were then pursuing. So they understood how that target market works. And so they can um, do things much more quickly than somebody who's got to learn uh, all of that. So for example, if you go look at those guys as they start their businesses, they're normally not going to all the startup boot camps that the incubators and accelerators provide because they don't need that. They go to some of the specialized ones that provide special things that they do decide that they need, but they are not going to the generalized ones where the guys are saying, okay, this is how you do a business plan because they already know how to do the business plan. Yes. And they understand how to write your first draft and then how to evolve that into a significant one as opposed to thinking that you can just put together a PowerPoint over a weekend and that people will actually think it's wonderful. Yeah, uh, the, that startup CEO needs leadership skills. He needs to know how to recruit people to put together a, a balanced team. In other words, he wants to have maybe two or three people uh, with gender diversity or, and or ethnic diversity in there so that uh, that diversity provides for better decision-making, better types of curiosity that will help you solve problems. And uh, you probably want somebody with sales skills, business skills, and uh, technical skills as three different people. Uh, if you don't have a co-founder in there with sales skills, it's very unlikely that you're ever going to get to successfully raise, raise your first round of investment because you won't be able to establish enough traction in the marketplace in most cases. Uh, so you need to be able to attract a nice, well-balanced team. You need to be able to get those guys to work together. It's also convenient if they have a history of working together. So for example, at one time I had a contract with a major semiconductor company to bring in fabulous system on a chip startups for them to consider investing in or licensing or buying. And one of the startups I took in was a team that had all worked together in another company. And there was basically half of the executive suite of that company had quit and somehow or other had done this in a way that they didn't get sued. And so uh, 
part of what protected them was they had then gone and licensed some brand new technology so that existing company had no way to criticize the technology they were using because it didn't come from that company. And then they were seeking funding. And of course, the advantage they had was they could sit there and say, well, the five of us have all been working together for the last four or five years. And we also had the same roles. So the guy, the CEO, used to be the CEO that we all work for. The guy, the CFO, used to be the CFO that we all work for, et cetera. And they also said to my client, so you're the first company that we presented to. And uh, my client really liked that because they prefer to invest in stealthy things that the rest of the world doesn't know about. If you've gone and presented it to 50 investors, it's a lot harder to get anybody to invest in you after that's happened. So you, you need to have employees who are world class for the type of startup that you want to start, assuming that you're trying to do a company that's going to uh, work at the international level and uh, be worldwide. Um, if you're trying to start a startup that's uh, only going to work in, uh, let's say, Manchester, England, and they're not going to go anywhere outside of that, then of course you don't need to have world-class people because you're only worried about doing it in that one city. But you're also not going to get the same types of investors because the best investors who have the most money and the most skills to help you with are working on the larger uh, opportunities. And by the way, the way that different rounds of investments are structured in Europe is more casual than the way it's done in Silicon Valley. At the end of the so-called B round, the second round of venture capital investment in Silicon Valley, the venture capitalists expect that they will then have more than 51% of the equity in the startup. And at that point, they're going to have a private meeting where they decide which of the officers they want to replace in order to be sure that they can achieve a successful exit. That brings on a really interesting point, um, and I know I've had this um, conversation many times because it's, it's, it's a balance of people or ideas, isn't it? So is it the idea that wins or is it the people that win? Like that's a really interesting debate and I would love your viewpoint on that. It's almost always the people. The investors are investing in a team and if they're really impressed with your team, they will put up uh, with a lot. So for example, if you look at Amazon, Amazon went for years without profits and the investors allowed them to do that because they bought into the vision uh, that Jeff Bezos and the other um, uh, co-founders had and they wanted to help them achieve a major market position before they worried about uh, co-founders. And uh, there are other examples of, of that as well. But in most cases, the founders do not have the ability to convince the investors to hang in there for 10 years while they create a wonderful market position. You know, John's for example, I know one angel investor who wants um, to exit his position in 24 to 36 months which means he's looking for a good enough fundraise to occur that he can then sell out his position. Now, in Silicon Valley, it would be difficult for an angel investor to do that because the assumption would be that that meant he had lost faith and therefore the startup's got a problem. But outside of Silicon Valley, that's an easier thing to do, assuming that you can project that you've got good more progress and good market traction. Uh, speaking of the team, I've heard that people, you know, very dedicated people that sometimes get together to, to do the startup, uh, they later run into problems of how to then, you know, split uh, the ownership of the company. Uh, what's your experience? Do you always advise them to clearly split it uh, beforehand or, or um, do the people that you work with ever run into this situation? There's, you know, this, this discussion going on later on after the company started. Yeah, that can be a major problem. Uh, in the well-organized and thought out startup, uh, you're putting together your key co-founders before you do company formation. And you're agreeing on how equity is going to be split between the officers. Now, if you're going for an IPO exit, then uh, 
the investment bankers have certain attitudes about the percentage of equity that each type of officer should have. And so there's an existing structure where you can know what you should do. If you're going for an acquisition exit, then the acquiring company and the um, investors don't care so much about who's got how much equity, but basically it works best if the people who are going to do the most work get the most equity, which usually means the CEO gets the most equity and that other people get less. But uh, basically, you know, a year or two or three down the road, all of those people who have equity need to think that it's been equitably distributed. Otherwise, you've got a problem to deal with. And uh, they also have to have been educated to understand that their equity position is going to be diluted. Uh, because if two years later you've got somebody who says, what do you mean I'm going to be diluted? You know, uh, that's a problem because he's supposed to know, he or she's supposed to know that that'll happen. Yeah. But I guess equity is a really interesting one um, because it's a percentage, isn't it? You know, and, uh, but for me, it's more about, is it, is it more about percentage or is it about the value of that percentage? And I guess the only percentage that's important is that 51 plus. Or are all the other percentages important as well? Like, what's your opinion on that? Well, what really matters to the individual is that at the time of the exit, whether it's an IPO or an acquisition, what is the valuation of the company? Exactly. If it's valued at $10 billion, then even if he's got a very small piece, he's going to make a lot of money. For example, when Walmart went public, they had had a policy that every employee had equity. So there were janitors who made a million dollars on their IPO. Uh, if uh, the 51% the issue at the time that the investors, you know, decide they own the company and they want to decide how to replace uh, officers, that's an important issue there. Um, but you know, the well-informed uh, co-founders know that's going to happen. Mm. Now, of course, some co-founders don't take the time to be well-informed, which can be a problem. The smart CEO who's creating a group of co-founders makes sure that everybody knows how the system works before he lets them sign on. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, so, so a different way to say that is that the percentage that really counts is the percentage at the time of the exit and the valuation of the company at the time of exit, which so how much money you're going to walk away with. Mm -hmm. um, the valuation at the end of six months really isn't important. And how much you have in terms of percentage really isn't important because you're going to be diluted and end up with a smaller number uh, yeah. later on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking, John, uh, a completely different question. Let's say there's someone in the audience, you know, sitting there thinking, it sounds exciting. I, I do want to do, you know, someone with entrepreneurial mindset, but they don't really have a product on their mind yet. Is there anything that you can uh, advise them where, where to look for a product, how to look for a product? Well, you want to end up with a team of co-founders who likes each other, who wants to work with each other and who's willing to not get paid any salary for a period of time while you build the startup up enough so that you can justify using the little cash that you've got to pay some salaries. Um, it's ideal if they've worked together before. It's ideal if uh, at least some of them have experience in launching products in your intended uh, target market. Uh, so you can have one guy with, or man or woman, who with a vision of what that product might be and other people could sign on board, but it really works best if there's a reason that they're there. Remember, you wanna be able to tell the investors that all of our co-founders are world-class people for this particular offering. So that means that each of those co-founders has a background that supports the statement that they're world-class for this offering. You know, if the guy is a tennis pro and you're trying to launch a quantum computer startup, then, you know, that may not work well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
whereas if you're launching a, a tennis based business, you know, that might work a lot better. Um, the uh, so if you just decide that you want to launch a business, then one way to do that is to get a group of co founders together where you all like each other and you've got complementary skills, and then together you decide what that product might be. and you decide that uh, together you've got enough experience launching products into that intended market that the team will be strong in that area. And then you go and do all of your market research to determine that there actually is need for that. You need to be solving a market pain, by which I mean, after you launch this product, uh, the customers need to buy it because it's something they have to have. It has to be mission critical to something that the company is doing that's essential to the business that the company is in. Yeah. So that the company is going to know that they have to buy it. They're not going to think, well, we don't need to buy it this month. We'll wait a couple of months. They want to buy it because it's something they need right now in order to solve a problem or achieve a great advantage or, or whatever that is. So, uh, no well-informed investor is going to invest in an offering which the potential customers perceive as a nice to have, as opposed to a have to have. Mm -hmm. the, the investor wants to talk to paying customers. It's very hard to raise money unless you have paying customers. Yeah. The investor wants to talk to the paying customers and have them say, well, this offering solves this key problem for us, uh, which helps us do this mission critical activity. So we have to have this and we're very happy with the way the company solves the problem. You know, uh, it's really interesting to talk about the cycle of a startup. And I know that you've used that terminology before. So can you explain to our viewers? And, and by the way, if you do have any questions, because you've got an expert at your tips right now, if you have any questions, put them in the comments and we will um, ask them right at the end. But to talk about the cycle of a startup, you've used that terminology before. Can you explain to our viewers what that cycle is, what it represents and, and what the elements of that cycle? Well, there's several different cycles. There's the concept of the offering where first you're going to envision a vision statement for the startup of what it's going to do. And then you're going to uh, describe a mission statement, which for an early stage startup is what you're going to do in the next couple of years. And then you're going to develop some sort of prototype and you're going to evolve that into a functional prototype. And then you're going to evolve that into a minimum viable product and then you're going to start selling that to people and you're going to modify it to work better so that you have a uh, good what's called product market fit having excellent product market fit is really very important and that product market fit includes not just the characteristics of your offering but also your business model of uh, how information money and uh, product are moving around between the different players who are involved. Uh, you need to be doing that in a way that is superior to what your competition is doing so that your uh, sales cycle, sales funnel is operating uh, more quickly, more or a higher percentage of uh, uh, output than your competition is. And you want to have fewer of your customers leaving than your competition does because your uh, investors are going to be very interested in how you're better than the competition. I mean, they're going to sit there and say, okay, so who are the three major competitors? And you better not say that we don't have any competitors because then the investor is going to lose interest right away because he doesn't believe you. Um, so he's going to say, he or she will say, who are your three major competitors and how do you do your sales cycle and your business model better? than each of them. You know, why do we want to invest in you instead of them? Um, and Drayson, one of the famous VCs in Silicon Valley said a few years ago that his way of investing was to look at the very hot, wonderful startup that had just received massive investment from major VCs and then to go look for the next generation startup that was going to replace it and take all the business away after that first generation had built up the market. Uh, so, 
you have to be launching that product uh, during what we call a window of opportunity. In other words, if you launch it too early, it won't sell. And if you launch it too late, then there's too much competition. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to fit into the window of opportunity and achieve um, your critical mass of customers before competition shows up and starts to make like life difficult for you. So you need to have an unfair competitive advantage that will last for two to three years while you accomplish that. So we've talked a little bit about the product life cycle uh, or, or how you launch the, the product and how you make that work. Um, let's talk about funding for a little bit. So when you first uh, launch a startup, then the co-founders, maybe just the uh, CEO, the found, key founder, will put some money in. And as other co-founders in, come in, they'll put some money in. And then you do a round where you go to your friends and family uh, and you raise money. We call that friends, family, and fools. It's the people who will put in money very, very early. And then you're going to go out and build a prototype, build a minimum vial product and start selling that to people. And when you've got um, some minimal number of customers, which varies depending on various aspects of what you're selling. Um, then you can go raise your first seed round or your first angel round from uh, what would normally be called angel investors. Sometimes they're early stage VCs. And then you're probably going to do a second seed round or a second angel round. And then you're going to do the first round of professional venture capital investment called the A round. Then you'll probably do a B round it's after the B round that the Silicon Valley investors expect to own 51% of the equity. And then you'll probably do a C round and then you'll do an exit. And when you try to raise that first C round, you need to be prepared to discuss uh, how and when that exit's going to work because the investors are very interested in how large you think revenue and valuation are going to be in say year five, because that determines which types of investors will invest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're, if you can reasonably project a hundred million dollars in revenue in year five, then you're going to attract the very best investors. And if you're only going to project 20 million in year five, you're going to attract very different investors. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, You've got, you know, a, a various things relating to the evolution of the product. You've got various things relating to the evolution of the funding. And then you've got a whole series of other activities that go on to support all the different functional areas. You know, you gradually evolve to have more sophisticated uh, financial management, financial controls. You evolve to have more sophisticated uh, human resources and hiring practices. And uh, you evolved to have written product migration plans and uh, you launch a business development activity and uh, your business development activity becomes more sophisticated. You launch a corporate development activity which will put in place uh, a low level of effort early stage plan to start getting you in contact with potential acquiring entities, assuming you're going to do an acquisition exit, so that when you finally get to the point where you want to sell the company, that you would have something like three, maybe even five different companies that want to bid to buy it. The idea is that when you actually want to sell the company, you don't want to be talking to just one potential acquirer. You would like to have maybe three doing competitive bids so that you have what Silicon Valley calls a feeding frenzy so that the startup sells for a higher uh, price than it would yeah. if only one was bidding on it. Yeah. So if you think of any functional area that's going to exist in that particular company, then it's going to start out as a very ad hoc uh, activity and it's going to grow into being a very sophisticated activity by the time you're getting close to the financial exit. Yeah. So then the million dollar question is, how long is that cycle um, in time? So we understand that what needs to happen, but how much time on average does a startup take to go from the first seed investment to then exit? Well, that varies a lot depending on what you're developing. So for example, at the longest end, you're talking about 
let's say, the development of a drug which has to go through invasive testing, invasive meaning things going inside somebody's body, um, and all of the FDA controls for that. And that may take 17, 18, 20 years. Um, or at the very other end, you might be talking a startup. Now, normally a startup is going to take, you know, probably five, seven years. And that, of course, would vary a lot. But there have been cases where people made it happen very quickly. So, for example, there was a startup in Silicon Valley about 10 years ago that I happen to know about where two guys founded the startup and uh, they got to, uh, you know, two of them got together, they formed the company, they interested an angel, the angel put in, you know, 50,000 or something like that. And they developed some prototypical software and provided it to uh, a couple of large companies where they were well connected. And the companies were very impressed. So something like seven or eight months after they had done company formation, they sold the company for $50 million. Wow. That is extremely unusual. You know, it's fantastic stories like that that get repeated a lot, but those things don't happen very often. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, shall we say, statistically unlikely. Yeah. Um, another issue to think about is how much it costs to uh, develop a company or start up all the way from the very beginning through the point where you can do an exit. And as a rough rule of thumb, it takes twice as much money to evolve a fabulous semiconductor company to the end as it does to evolve a startup company. So starting about 10 years ago, it started to become more difficult to uh, raise funding for a fabulous semiconductor company because the investor would say, well, if I invest in a software startup, I can invest in two for the price of investing in one fabulous company. So with two investments, I'm more diversified than with one. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I'm not going to invest in the fabulous semiconductor company. And that became a very interesting problem uh, to get investments for those. John, uh, someone might be sitting there thinking, okay, I don't want to fail this road. I want to become a successful startup. Um, if they decide to now say, I need an advisor, what is the uh, daily work with advisor? Like, how are things uh, working out for your clients with you? Uh, what's, what's the practical, actual work that you do together with your clients? Well, that varies all over the place, depending on what they want. So in some cases, I'm meeting with them once a week for three hours, and we're talking about what they're doing, what their objectives are and how to keep those aligned with objectives that we've established for the month and for the quarter and for the year. And uh, then in addition to that, we might also be talking about um, how to accomplish other things. For example, in one case, I was writing all the business development proposals for a startup because he didn't have the money to hire a VP of BizDev yet, but, and he didn't have time to do it himself. So I was helping him write those. Um, in another case, I was writing the monthly report to the investors because, well, at the beginning of every month, I would say, do you want me to draft the monthly report for you? And he would say, no, I'll take care of it. And two weeks later, he would always say, I'm busy, draft the report for me. And so I would draft it and then he would edit it and show it to the investors. Um, so what happens really varies depending on what the startup needs, which depends on how things are evolving and uh, what's important. So for example, I'm working with uh, one startup that's very small and I'm essentially acting as their VP of business development, but the fact that we're calling it business development really isn't accurate. I'm really just extending the office of the president to help accomplish certain things uh, that um, need to be done. And how long that takes can vary depending on uh, what the company needs. That might be a couple of days or a month, or it might be a week, a month, or it might be half time. You know, it depends on uh, what the startup needs. So every startup is a little different. And so the, uh, the startup CEO needs to understand his business well enough to know what he needs. And then he needs to find a potential advisor who uh, the two of them are willing to trust each other and uh, figure out how to work together. 
So what do you look for? So if somebody came to you and said, right, John, um, you know, I need some advice. What is it that you look for before you decide whether or not you will or will not work with somebody? Well, I would want to see the so-called pitch deck that all startups have put together. And I would want to understand what I thought of the reasonableness of the product offering, the reasonableness of the team, and uh, whether or not they'd really done interesting effort to prepare this or whether it, you know, looked like a very casual, you know, sloppy thing. Mm -hmm. And then I would ask them uh, lots of questions about what they were doing. And then if we seemed to like each other, I would say, okay, let's define a project that's going to last about a month where we try working together and see uh, how well we like working together. And mm -hmm. so at the end of the month, um, if I'm not impressed, I'm going to do a gracious exit. And of course, if the startup decides that I'm not what he needs, then, you know, he's going to want to go hire somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's see if you have any questions. Um, I appreciate that somebody might be watching this on replay. And if you are, then please do write a question in the comments because John has given me permission to email him with any questions that you have, and then he will respond and I'll respond uh, with the comments below. So if you do have any questions for John, please let us know in the comments. And if you're watching this on replay, um, let me know what your questions are and I will definitely be able to get a response from John for you. So so that kind of brings us to, um, I mean, we could talk about this subject for hours, but I want to respect John's time. <laughs> but we've gone through so much in the last 45 minutes. You know, it's, is it people or idea? And I think John's made a really good case about it being about the people. You don't need to have a Facebook kind of idea. If you've got the right people, you can make it happen. Are you going for an IPO or an acquisition exit? We talked about the different cycles of a startup and we talked about the cycle of, of the product and the skills that you need um, for a startup. So before I hand it over to Carlina, I just want to ask a finale question to John. And going on from the theme that Carlina have of adding value into the marketplace, what value do you feel in a post-COVID world is needed in the marketplace right now? Well, that really depends on what sector you talk about and which sort of activity you talk about in that sector. For example, the manufacturing shop floor of a manufacturing company is going to potentially have a need for something that's very different than what the sales department in that same company needs, which is going to be very different from what a a company that's trying to provide support to robotics used in hospitals to deliver things around to the different departments. Uh, you know, what is that? So uh, fleet management of robotics is becoming a more interesting uh, topic at, at this point in time. Um, but, you know, that only applies to certain sectors, primarily warehouses and some parts of manufacturing and some parts of hospitals and a few other places, but uh, there is a considerable amount of money in the order of billions of dollars being spent on uh, startups in space. Now, these startups in space are funded by people with a lot of money, such as Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. But uh, I think there's 20 different companies who are basically working to be able to do something that approximates mining minerals off of asteroids because of the vast uh, amount of money that's there. Uh, so I think that that's essentially proceeding very differently than uh, a lot of things that are sort of, shall we say, related to COVID. Um, in the electric vehicle area, uh, Tesla is doing extremely well, you know, uh, Senior executives in one car company said that they were two years, Tesla was two years ahead of everybody. Uh, a senior executive in another car company who didn't mean to be quoted uh, was quoted as saying that Tesla was 10 years ahead. So Tesla has, uh, I mean, Elon Musk has done a great job of investing his money to achieve a tremendous advantage. And so all those other uh, car electric vehicle car companies are trying to figure out how to catch up. 
And so there's opportunities to provide things to do that. And so uh, the real answer to your question is it, it, it totally varies depending on what sector you're talking about. But the, the basic thing that's important is that the investor wants to know that you have achieved market traction and are selling things in the current advisor in environment and that you can make a very strong case for the fact that the sectors that you're selling to are going to continue to want to buy your product for the next two or three years. Uh, otherwise, the investor is not going to want to risk your money with you. Investors always have more opportunities uh, presented to them than they can invest in. So they're going to take the ones that look like the best deal to them. You know, John, um, I've become so encouraged after listening to this this conversation also prior to, to the live that we've got. You know, I'm the type of a serial entrepreneur mindset <laughs> who's never just going to stop having new ideas. And so um, think, um, hearing out your realities and com comparing those to my mindset, I got really encouraged. And uh, I truly hope, we are, as, as Lena said, we are here to help people raise value in the marketplace. And I really hope that someone listening to this also got encouraged to begin their personal um, economical behavior. <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. Um, and, and start something new here. Um, is there anything that you feel that you still want to tell to the people who are about to get started um, before we let you go? Well, somebody who's going to launch a startup really needs to understand why they're doing it and why they have the background skills that and experience that makes it reasonable for them to do it. They should not be doing it because they've got fired and they don't can't think of anything else to do. Uh, that would not be likely to produce success. Uh, you know, having said that, um, one of the business journals in the United States, Crane's Chicago Business, uh, wrote an article during a recession like 20 years ago where they uh, reported on all of the Fortune 500 companies that had been launched during recessions in the United States where you know the basic pitch they were making was these were guys who were vice presidents in fortune 500 companies they got fired uh, due to the recession so therefore they took their money and started something um, that's certainly true and that will certainly continue to happen but the guy who's a vice president in fortune 500 has a lot of management skills and a, a lot of financial resources and a lot of ability to sit there and work on something for a while before it starts returning uh, cash flow, um, which you know the average person doesn't have. Well, thank you so much, John, for your time. It's been a pleasure. I've personally learned so much. And as Carlina said, you've massively encouraged me as well. Uh, thank you, Carlina, for your time today. Um, I want to say bye and have a great weekend to everyone. I'll hand it over to Carlina to close out. Yeah, well, thank you, John, so much. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, having to, you know, meet you again in a lifetime. Uh, you know, life's <laughs> not over. Uh, COVID hasn't, uh, hasn't taken over the world. Uh, I hope not forever. I hope we get through this period and I hope um, we find new ways to live in the, in the world right now. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Carlina. And thank you, Lena. I appreciate the invitation and all your kind words. Oh, you are so welcome. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.